Hey everybody. Uh, this is the 10 steps to performing a roof inspection class. And my name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. Uh, we're the world's largest organization of residential and commercial property inspectors. And we do um, online education. Um, this is an online class. And uh, we do one or two, three online classes uh, just about every month. And um, they are free. Uh, we also have a, a school, a physical facility, in which I am uh, right now. Uh, this is one of our webinar rooms. And um, teaching this uh, as a live class. You may be watching this um, on YouTube. Um, but uh, So thanks for joining the class. And if you wanted to register for the next upcoming class or watch a past class, a recent class, we record them all. Uh, go to this URL. It's nachi.org, N-A-C-H-I dot O-R-G slash class. And there you'll find um, the InterNACHI School, which is um, within the InterNACHI headquarters building. So we teach live classes, hands-on classes. Uh, we have inspectors coming in, getting advanced training at the House of Horrors. You could practice your home inspections. You can practice performing a home inspection at the House of Horrors, which is a house, an entire house with a thousand defects built under our roof at InterNACHI headquarters. And that's called the House of Horrors. So thank you everyone for um, coming to the class. And um, in this class, we're going to learn the 10 steps to performing a roof inspection. And after this class, email me, um, ben at internachi.org, and I will send you a link to the final exam. The exam is online, and it's free. There are no exam fees. You can take the exam over and over again, um, and uh, there's no penalty to doing that. And once you pass the final exam, you'll receive a certificate of completion. And you can download that. It's electronic. You can print it out, um, and you can use that for attaining CE. Um, Internet GCE. So this is a two-hour online live class. You can upload this um, to your education log through your Internet G membership account in your education log, and it's worth two CE after you pass the exam. Um, if you are a member, you're going to log into the final exam using your username and password. If you are a non-member, um, you need a username and password, so I'll provide that for you for free. You'll have a free student account for six months in order to access the final exam to this class. And the objective of this class is to teach you how uh, good practices on inspecting a roof. Um, actually, it's a roof covering. So we refer to it as a roof covering or roof covering materials. Um, Careful what you say about uh, inspecting a roof. Um, someone may construe that as you inspecting the entire roof system. As a home inspector, we really don't inspect the entire roof system, including all of its components, because we perform visual only inspections. For example, the underlayment is not visible during a typical home inspection, right? So um, we are teaching this class on components that are not visible during a typical home inspection. We're going beyond the scope of what a typical home inspector would do during a home inspection. After successful completion of this class, you'll be able to do essentially two things. Report upon the installation of the roof covering and underlayment, and make sure that it complies with um, general building standards or recommendations of most shingle manufacturers. And you'll also be able to report on the installation of the roof and um, roof covering materials such that um, water intrusion should be prevented, right? So uh, we're going to take a look at defects that would um, go against those two things. We're looking for good best practices followed by code or uh, best practices or local authority having jurisdiction or shingle manufacturer installations and um, an installation that would help prevent roof leaks. That's essentially what you'll be able to do after this class. Because more than three quarters of all US homes in Canada um, use asphalt shingles, we're gonna focus primarily on that type of roof covering. And this class teaches you how to inspect components that are not required to be inspected during a home inspection, 
perform to the InterNACHI standards of practice. For example, this class teaches about underlayment, which is beyond the visual scope of a home inspector. The scope of this training class does not cover identifying and evaluating holes in the roof, bad events, um, uh, terrible conditions, right? Like bubbling or curling or cracking or wear and tear. Those things are going to be self-evident and uh, relatively understandable just by looking at them. We're going to look at the other things that I mentioned. So according to the standards of practice of InterNACHI, which is at nachi.org SOP, the inspector shall inspect from ground level or eaves. Uh, that's the area next to the gutter. Um, the roof covering materials, gutters, downspouts, vents, flashing, skylights, chimneys, and anything that penetrates the roof covering material. And then the general structure of the roof from readily accessible panels, doors, or stairs. And you're also required by the standards, InterNACHI standards, shall, you shall describe the, the type of roof covering materials. And in this class, again, we're going to cover asphalt shingles because it's very common in the United States. And you're also required to report as in need of correction, observed indications of active roof leaks. Now, if you're from New York, this uh, class, um, again, um, uh, you have a different standard of practice. In New York, um, Title IX, Section 197, 5.7, roof systems, uh, you have a different standard. It's similar, but slightly different. And always, um, InterNACHI standards of practice gets trumped by local or state standards and practices. Now, um, we often see clauses in inspection reports that take this form. No visible evidence of, and then you say the defect. So no visible evidence of roof leaks. Well, we have a concern about those words that you may be using in your inspection reports, the words visible and evidence. Visible isn't all that great to use because um, someone may argue with you that it was visible. And that's hard to have a defense against, right? It's easy to accuse somebody that you were there and it was visible and you should have seen it. Well, um, so we have a concern about using that. And then also the word evidence. The word evidence suggests that um, there is um, a permanence to conditions. So evidence kind of stays the same, right? It's true evidence, it's a fact. And if it's true now, if it's evidence now, well then it must have been there in the past. And somebody could argue that it was, it was also visible to you. So if you use a statement like no visible evidence of defect, right? We have a concern about that. We recommend, actually our in, internal um, InterNACHI's in-house legal counsel, Mark Cohen, uh, recommends this phrase. I did not observe any indications of, and then you insert the defect, during my inspection. Now an inspector's duty isn't to report on everything that's visible, right? That's like impossible. But rather only those defects he or she observed and deems to be a material defect as defined by the standards of practice, a material defect. So we recommend using the phrase, I did not observe any indications of, related to this class, a roof leak during my inspection. And during my inspection is important in your phrase because it um, sets the expectation of your client, kind of documents when you are making this statement and reporting upon the observations. So um, it's at the time of the inspection. It's not now, I'm not looking at the house now. It's documented in my report that during my inspection, I did not observe any indications of this problem, right? It may have been there, but I can't report upon everything. I can only report upon the things that I observe. So careful with um, reporting upon roof leaks. Um, obviously, um, the we know as home inspectors that conditions change sometimes in a home almost immediately. So right after you leave, the condition of the home in a certain part of the home could change, right? If it's not raining during the inspection, 
the roof may leak in the future. Right after you leave and there's a rainstorm, the roof may leak. And I actually have language in my inspection report um, that says just about that. <laughs> after I leave, anything could happen. A lot of things can break. But I, my job is to um, report upon the things that I observed and I deemed to be a material defect during my inspection. All right, I know what you're thinking. Home inspectors walking on roofs. That's right. We do not walk upon any roof surface. Home inspectors are not required, I don't think by any standards that I've seen, to walk upon any roof surface. So do not, right? Um, there are many inspectors that do. And hopefully they've taken InterNACHI's online ladder safety course and training course, safety course, um, ladder course and safety course in order to do, in order to protect themselves. Um, we do not recommend it. It's dangerous to be up on a roof. Um, but this photo here, it, those are my feet. So I'll admit. Um, I used to be a home builder, uh, installed roofs. Um, I do have a good fear of heist, heights, which is uh, healthy for you if you're going to do uh, home inspections and ladders and things like that. Um, but again, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface. And we, you can visit the message board. There are many arguments pro and con against um, using a ladder, uh, walking on a roof, um, and uh, but you know you are required to inspect the roof. Even if it's a HOA, I tend to comment upon the roof. Uh, let's say it's a three-story building and I'm inspecting a condo on the second floor. I'm gonna try to inspect the roof because I don't know. I don't need to know the legal implications. Does everyone contribute to the roof? Um, does everyone know? Um, the condition of the roof. Does the HOA know the condition of the roofs in the neighborhood? Um, I'll take a look around. Um, I'll assess the roof for my client uh, without regard to the, um, um, does my client actually pay directly for the roof? Are they in the basement and the roof is three stories up? It really doesn't matter. I'm going to try to inspect the roof um, and don't walk upon the roof. It's not safe. And home inspectors are not code inspectors. So this class will go over a lot of um, code. We'll, we'll quote code, we'll look at code and practices and, and things like that. But we're not code inspectors. We do not inspect for code violations during a, a home inspection. However, it's good to understand that there are building standards with which common building practices are designed to comply with, right? In this training, we'll refer to some of those best practices and the International Residential Code, the IRC, for the following things. Roof covering materials, asphalt shingles, flashing, fasteners, and underlayment applications. Um, there is a lot written about those five things, um, about best practices, and also the code mentions those five things. Code doesn't mention a whole lot of things. Code, billing code, most, uh, well, the international ones, are kind of silent on many aspects of installing a roof. The manufacturer's installation instructions, typically found right on the bundle package of the shingles, is probably your single best source for many of the requirements for a really good, correct installation and uh, protection provided by the roof coverings. So what are the 10 steps to performing a roof inspection? Well, the first one is you got to check the roof covering. The roof covering materials is that which is uh, exposed, right? And gets the brunt of all the weather and the sun. And if you're going to walk on it, that's, that's what you're walking on. That's what you're really looking at. That's the top surface coating, right? Step two is you check the fasteners. Now, remember, remember, we're going beyond the scope of a typical home inspection, right? This is about... Um, learning a little bit more than you need to do during a home inspection. Uh, check the fasteners. So we're going to check. We're going to go over the fasteners. We're going to talk about the fasteners in this class. We're going to check the deck sheathing. Um, that's that substrate upon which the roof covering materials um, is fastened to. Yeah. Uh, we're going to check the slope and underlayment. Um, don't use pitch unless you know what pitch is. Um, Pitch has something to do with the entire span of the structure, or it's that black sticky stuff. Uh, slope is what we use. And underlayment, 
We're going to check the slope and underlayment, and they are related to each other. We're going to check the ice barrier. Uh, you know, one third of the country is cold climate, about, let's say. So um, there are some really cool things to know about ice barriers. Um, even if you're right now in, um, you're not in New York or in the East Coast or in a cold climate, if you're in a dry area, arid area, um, you may be interested in what we say about ice barriers. Um, check the drip edge. So you got to check the drip edge. That's at the, not only at the eaves, but at the rake. We're going to take a look at the rake too. Check for an offset pattern. Now, um, we, we know that there are um, many different ways and styles of uh, installing a roof. You can go uh, offset, you can go pyramid, um, you can rack them. Um, there is a shingle that allows racking going straight up, um, but it's really up to the uh, shingle manufacturer. So we're going to check for an offset pattern because that's typically common for a traditional installation of an asphalt shingle roof with strip shingles. Check the roof valley flashing. Um, that's, I tend to walk up the roof valley. Again, according to the standards of practice, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface. Um, we're going beyond that in this class. Check the roof valley flashing. I love to, you know, on a, on a cut valley, I love to grab some shingles and pull it up a little bit, see what's there, see how it's fastened. Is there dog ears? Is there a sealant? Um, is it California cut? Um, so we'll take a look at the roof valley flashing and check the nail penetration into the deck sheathing. The fasteners really need to be the right length and they need to go into that substrate. And check the flashing areas. Anything that you know uh, intersects with the roof covering materials, anything, um, we should check those things. We're gonna, so that's the 10 steps. If you do those 10 steps, you're probably um, doing a pretty good roof inspection during your home inspection, you know? Uh, a lot of these things, again, are beyond the scope of a typical home inspection, which is visual only. We don't, we're not required to lift shingles, pull shingles, lift them up, look underneath things. We're not required to confirm, according to Internet standards of practice, confirm underlayment, fastening, and things like that. Um, so uh, we're going a little bit beyond that in this class. So hey, let's take a pre-assessment quiz to see how much you know prior to starting this class. How much do you know about um, doing a roof inspection? So let's see, I gotta drag this over. Let's see if I can do it. There we go. Oh, and logistically, you should all be able to see me and hear me. I can't see you and hear you, all right? And if you are from New York, I've sent you a couple emails about New York, just to give you a heads up. Uh, let's take a look at the pre-assessment. It's like a quiz. So here's some questions, and I'll give you some moment. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or something, um, this is a live class, but I'm gonna give you a couple moments uh, if you're watching the video recording of this class to answer the question before we answer it. So it says, I hope you can see this. Let me see if I can bump it up. An asphalt shingle roof is water blank, not waterproof. What do you think the answer is? There's four potential answers. Uh, resistant, deterrent, resilient, and logged. That's all shingle roof is waterlogged, not waterproof. Yeah, so I'm gonna go for um, resistant. Okay. Um, blank shingles are called architectural or dimensional shingles. Blank shingles are called architectural dimensional shingles. Laminated shingles, organic reinforced, three tab, or single. So is it laminated, organic reinforced, three tab, or single? Blank shingles are called architectural or dimensional shingles. I'm gonna go for, uh, what, laminated? Okay. Blank lap is the lap of the underlayment that runs parallel to the eaves. So what does that roll, that roll that runs parallel to the eaves, what's that called? Because if you're going to talk about that one, that, that row of underlayment, because that's where all the action is really, um, what do you refer to it? 
row one, row one. So you have bottom, uh, end, front, and top. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, uh, end. Let's go with top. A uh, few more. Fastener nails for asphalt shingles should have a minimum head diameter. So that's the top flat part of that nail, right? The minimum head diameter going across of what? Half inch, three eighths of an inch, three quarters of an inch, or one inch? That's not one inch. See those big nails with a one inch head? Never miss. I'm gonna go with three eighths. The drip edge at the blank goes over the underlayment. The drip edge, okay, that's that middle thing, at the blank goes over the underlayment. So imagine the underlayment, let's say it's felt, you know, tar paper, 30 pound, 15 pound. What's the, when, when the drip edge goes over that, where are we? Are we at the eaves or at the rake? The eaves or the rake? I'm gonna go with eaves. Blank flashing is, is installed where a roof intersects a head wall. A head wall is really any kind of like vertical structure that's not the roof. Um, you know, it's part of the building. So a head wall. Um, any, uh, blank flashing is installed where a roof intersects a head wall. So where a roof intersects a head wall, what's that called? Is that counter flashing? Backer flashing? Apron flashing or step flashing. I'm gonna go with apron. Okay, grade the quiz. Oh, I wonder what it was. The drip edge at the blank goes over the underlayment, and I selected eaves. Ah, oh, right. At the rake, right? <laughs> Gotta be exciting. At the rake, like at the gable roof. On the edge of the gable roof edge, there's the, that's the rake. And there's a drip edge at the rake, typically installed. It's, it looks really nice and it helps end the shingle and helps divert water or shed water away too. Uh, and it covers some double layers and covers the, uh, it, it's really good to have it installed. It really should be installed. And it goes over the underlayment. So the underlayment, let's just say, let's call it the, you know, the stuff, the, oh, you gotta call it the underlayment. Using these terms, you get kind of confusing. It goes over the underlayment at the rake. The drip, ed the drip edge flashing goes over the underlayment at the rake. And at the eaves, you want that water to shed off. So you want that water to shed right off if it goes underneath the shingle and drip right into the gutter. So the, the underlayment goes over the drip edge flashing. I hope that was fun. Okay. So that's your pre-assessment. If you didn't answer any of those questions well. Um, I'm glad you're taking the class or watching the video. But we also have, Internet actually has free online training courses about inspecting roofs. And um, they're free and online to members uh, with unlimited access. So before we proceed, step by step, let's go over a few basic concepts. One is shedding water. You gotta understand how water moves. Um, to inspect a roof, and also to inspect a house, uh, and the exterior and the surrounding ground. Uh, we're going to go over what reinforcement means, uh, shapes, there's shapes of shingles. There's a top lap hmm, and an end lap. We got that right. That was, we, asked about, we were asked about that first row of underlayment, right, along the eaves. Slope or pitch. Just think of pitch... As you, if you're a home inspector, just think of pitch as that black sticky stuff, okay? We use slope. And self-sealing strips, uh, we're going to look at some open valleys and closed valley concepts, okay? Let's go over those concepts first because if we just dive into things, you'll be like, well, what's an end lap? Or why aren't you using the word pitch? Um, asphalt shingles are designed to be layered. And the layering sheds water, right? So you have things that... Um, you start at the bottom and you layer it on top of each other and water sheds off of that. Pretty easy. Um, an asphalt shingle roof is water resistant, not waterproof. It's not waterproof. An asphalt shingle roof, if it's installed correctly at the right slope, um, at any slope really, um, asphalt shingle strip shingle roof is water resistant. It's not waterproof. 
So whenever somebody has a problem with my roof inspection, I always make sure that they, they were set up with the right expectation, that their roof is not waterproof. It will leak if left alone. It shall leak if left alone, right? Ideally, you want your roof to in be inspected every year. If you're in a cold climate, maybe before winter to prepare for the eventual roof leak. All roofs leak. I've said that in my inspection reports, and they all do if left alone and in poor condition or poorly installed or if they have a problem. Just because I inspected the roof doesn't mean I'm guaranteeing that it's waterproof. Mm -mm. Even when you install a brand new roof, there's no guarantee of waterproof. It's water resistant because it could leak under certain conditions. A shingle roof essentially relies on the slope of the roof to shed the water. So if it's not if it's not sloped properly, it's not installed properly and it won't shed. And therefore, it's not water resistant either. It's going to be a roof, a roof that leaks. Asphalt shingles are reinforced so that they're strong. They're referred to as either organic reinforced asphalt shingles or glass fiber reinforced shingles, fiberglass. Most of the shingles you'll see will be glass fiber or fiberglass um, shingles. The organic ones um, may, that we see will probably be old um, and they'll be comparatively really thick. Um, organic shingles or really thick shingles. There are three shapes or types of asphalt shingles. There are strip shingles, very common. We, we, all those you know, shingles that are wider than higher, they're called strip shingles. They're in a strip. Laminated strip is another shape. Laminated strip shingles, um, we'll talk about that, have dimension, and they're layered or individual shingles, which are smaller. Strip shingles are generally longer in width than in height, and a common dimension is three feet by one foot, okay? And shingles called three-tab and laminated are also, they're all categorized as strip shingles. They're all strip shingles. Three-tab and laminated shingles are strip shingles. Strip shingles are self-adhering. They have that um, adhesive strip on them that bonds the shingles to the other ones that are lapping. So again, uh, shingles are installed to shed, so they're installed like this, and they also have strip, uh, um, self-adhering, uh, it's glue, essentially. And so when uh, they lie on top of each other, they're going to be um, bonded to each other, glued to each other. Laminated strip shingles are called arch architectural or dimensional shingles. These shingles have an additional laminated material to give the shingle a thickness, a random thickness, and a dimensional architectural appearance. They're also self-adhering. And individual shingles are smaller than strip shingles. You need many more of them to cover the same area. They're typically shaped like diamonds, octagons, fish scales, scalloped, and some of them are interlocking with each other. Um, but individual shingles are uh, uncommon. The term top lap is a lap of underlayment that runs parallel to the eaves. The term end lap is the lap of underlayment at the end of the roll. The term slope or pitch indicate the incline of a roof expressed as a proportion of the vertical to the horizontal, and they do not mean the same thing. So this illustration shows how a simple gable roof and the general relationship between rise, run, and span relate to each other. Um, the roof framing is basically a practical application of geometry, and the roof slope is um, based upon the properties of a right triangle. So in roof framing, the base of this right triangle is called the run, and the run is the distance from the outside of the wall's top plate to a point directly below the center of the ridge. And the vertical leg of the triangle is called the rise, which is the distance that the roof rafter um, extends above the wall's top plate. And the slope is the incline of the roof expressed as a ratio of the vertical rise to the horizontal run, where run is some proportion of the span. In this illustration, the run is one half. It looks like an, um, a nice 
uh, gable roof where the two slopes are equal to each other, right? So the run is one half of the span. But let's say you have kind of like a, a leaning roof where the center of the ridge is not in the center of the span, but it's over to the side. So run is some proportion of the entire span. Pitch is the proportion of the vertical to the entire span. This is from one wall plate to another. That's pitch, actually. It's an old term. We use slope. Um, and the ratio is always expressed as inches per foot. So the slope ratio, a roof that rises four inches for every one foot or 12 inches is said to have a, a four in 12 slope. A same thing with um, six inches. If it's six inches rise for every 12 inches of run, then the roof slope is six and 12. And the slope can be expressed numerically as a ratio with a colon, right? So a, a four and 12 slope can be expressed as four colon 12. A six and 12 could be six colon 12. In this illustration, our architectural uh, uh, elevation drawing, uh, there's a triangle there that says 812. So we know that the slope of this roof section here is eight units over 12, eight inches for every 12 horizontal. And the slope is expressed as a ratio and inches per foot. And common slopes, there's really three categorize, uh, categories. There's flat roofs. We're not gonna be inspecting a whole lot of flat roofs with asphalt shingles. Uh, there's low slope roofs. Uh, asphalt shingles can be applied to low slope roofs, which is 212 to 412 uh, with some consideration of the underlap. Conventionally, asphalt shingles are installed uh, 412 and up. A conventional roof can have a slope of 412, which means when 12 units are measured horizontally, the roof surface rises four vertical uh, units, four units vertically. Self-sealing strips refers to the adhesive on the shingle that's placed so that the lapped shingle will adhere to it, and it helps um, with uplift from strong winds. An open valley is one which the roof covering abuts the lining uh, or the flashing in the valley, and a lining is exposed and is typically metal. And a closed valley is one which one shingle, one plane of the roof is covered by the other one, and it's cut, so it's nice and the flashing is not exposed. All right, so those are some basic concepts. Uh, that was about a half hour, um, that's cool. So let's go to the 10 steps to performing a roof inspection. Uh, we listed them earlier in the class. Check one, uh, step one. <laughs> step one is check the roof covering, um, that which is exposed to the weather, the rain, the sun. You wanna determine if the roof covering is designed to provide a weather barrier. And the purpose of the covering is to protect the structure underneath from water intrusion, roof leaks, obviously, and damage caused by roof leaks. The design of the system must take into account the underlayment, the type of uh, roof geometry, weather conditions based upon location, and the type of roof covering materials. So we're gonna touch on um, ice barriers for cold climates. Um, there are illustrations that I would put in my inspection report to help convey um, concepts to my client, uh, like shedding and water and protection from moisture intrusion and drainage, drainage planes and drainage surfaces and the importance of flashing and kicking water away. Um, all these illustrations, we have thousands of them in our inspector gallery, and that's at this URL, nachi.org slash gallery, go there, you can download um, illustrations, low res, high res, uh, members um, have free access to that. If you're not a member um, and you'd like access to the gallery, there's a, an email, contact um, email there. The roof covering provides the first line of defense against all the elements. It tends to be the most exposed component of the building's exterior envelope. Therefore, roof coverings should be um, selected, detailed, and installed with a lot of consideration. Sometimes you can go to code. Code is often silent upon uh, the roof coverings. In the 2015 IRC, it says, uh, roof decks shall be covered with approved roofing, uh, roof coverings 
secured to the building structure, obviously. Uh, roof assemblies shall be designed and installed in accordance with this code and approved manufacturer's installation instructions, such that the roof assembly shall serve, serve to protect the building structure. A lot of big words that mean really uh, the roof should be installed properly so it doesn't leak. Building codes do not address many of the details, the specific details required for a complete and proper installation of a roof covering. You can look to code to provide information about what to inspect on a roof, but you won't find much detail. When the code says something like, in accordance with the manufacturer's installation instructions, don't take this lightly. It really means a lot. You have to go back and do a little research about the common installation guidelines or industry best practices. Um, these are important things to research. And there are many manufacturers of asphalt shingles um, that have technical information that's freely available. You can download them. In short, the thicker the asphalt shingle, the more quality it is, the longer it will last, the heavier it will be, and the better it will be. Heavier weighted shingles, laminated or textured shingles, tend to perform and even appear better. Um, they're really... Uh, I know a manufacturer that's simply not making 15-year, they're phasing it out, 15-year asphalt, three-tab shingles. They just don't like them. Um, I look at the edges of the roof covering, at the rake, and at the eaves, to see how many shingle layers there are. And it's fairly easy to see um, if there are two layers of shingles installed, or what is the underlying layer. So there's an inspection tip. Um, if you can get to the eave or to the rake, um, pull some shingles up, and I put up one or two fingers. One means one layer, two means two layers. Um, I haven't put up a three uh, in a while. And then um, if you pull up the shingles on a double layer on a re-roof, you can see how the re-roof has been installed. Um, at the bottom of a re-roof, you'll see that the exposure of the shingle is somewhat shorter, and that's because of the layering uh, the new re-roof needs to be kind of tucked in to the layer of the existing roof. And at the bottom of the roof, you'll have a shorter exposure, actually. And that's an indication, a quick indication that there could be a re-roof on the roof if you're looking at it near the eaves. And also, you can look at fastening and sealant and the actual condition and materials of the underlying layer. Um, that has an effect on the re-roof. With only a few exceptions, a second layer of roof covering should not be installed without first removing the existing roof covering. That's ideal. You don't want to actually re-roof, um, put on a new layer all the time. And this is especially important where the following conditions exist. Where the existing roof is water soaked or has really deteriorated um, to the point that the existing roof is not an adequate base for the new second layer. Uh, it's important when um, the existing roof covering is wood shake, slate, clay, cement, or asbestos cement tile. Shouldn't put asphalt shingles on top of that. And also where the existing roof has two or more layers of any type of roof covering, you shouldn't go three layers. Uh, and for asphalt shingles, when the house is in an area that has severe hailstorms, you really should rip off that old roof and put a new layer down because... Um, um, because of the hail impact. You don't want it to be spongy. Um, with a lot of layers, it would just be like, uh, it would just go right through. You want that um, snowball to pop. Uh, when the second roof covering is installed, I like to see the flashing all redone. The flashing should be reconstructed, reconstructed, reinstalled for that layer, that top layer. If I'm on an asphalt shingle roof and there's a second layer installed, I go almost immediately to the flashing areas. I like to see that the step flashing has been installed. That's really typical. Difficult. The step flashing is the hardest part of a re-roof. Um, so, and it looks like a mess if it's not done well. So um, when I, I think there's a re-roof, second layer, I go to the step flashing. If it's installed, great. If it's not, I'm going to recommend that the, um, a correction and further evaluation by a roofing professional um, come to the home. Because water can travel um, underneath missing that step flashing, 
it's not being kicked out or diverted away, so it'll travel underneath that new layer and get trapped. That was step one, check the roof covering. Let's go to step two. Step two, oh, there's uh, me pulling up a, a re-roof and no step flashing, right? You can see the counter flashing, but no step flashing. Uh, I can check out the fasteners and there's a high nail there, uh, right there, boop. Um, so we had a few things wrong on that. And always wear gloves, by the way. You should wear gloves on the exterior and you know some interior homes, especially around the bathrooms. Uh, step two is check the fasteners. Um, there's good fastening and bad fastening. And during a typical home inspection, we're not really seeing any fasteners. Um, it's gonna be almost impossible to check for fastening. However, there's a few things that every inspector should know. And here they are. Um, there's properly driven ones and improperly driven ones. A properly driven one is a fastener, a nail, that's um, straight with good penetration and flush at the sh shingle surface, so right here, right? And it goes into and through, ideally, uh, through the plywood. Um, and it, there's our head, right? Three eighths of an inch diameter. That was on the pre-assessment. Underdriven means it's sticking up in the air. Um, overdriven means it's sunk in, smashed in. That means there's a tear or a break um, in the material and um, at an angle is no good too for the same reason. In general, roofing nails for asphalt shingles should be driven straight, flush, and snug to the surface of the shingle. To avoid complete loss of a shingle, the roofing fasteners should not be overdriven. They'll just blow right off if they're all overdriven. If the compressor pump is gauged up way too high and the nailer is just slamming them in there, um, that's not good um, because the head will tear the material. Um, attention to fastening quality is equally important for other roofing materials, especially for tile and metal. Fasteners for asphalt shingles should be nails, corrosion resistant, like galvanized steel, stainless steel, aluminum, copper. The nail should be corrosion resistant to keep them from rusting away and leaving holes for water to seep through or for wind to blow the shingles off because of lack of attachment. So fasteners are good. Here's a fastener. Is that a roof fastener? Is that a shingle fastener? Is that a sheathing fastener? No, it's an underlayment. It's a little underlayment nail. I love these because uh, they help me from sliding off the roof um, when I'm installing the underlayment and the shingles. Um, the actual shingle fastener should have a minimum nominal shank diameter of 12 gauge with a minimum, minimum head diameter of 3 eighths of an inch. The nailing of hips and ridges in some roof accessories may require longer nails, right? Because the fasteners may have to go through more stuff, more layers of roofing material. Um, like, you know, when I install the ridge, um, some of those ridge things, the, the fasteners are way off. There's about an inch off of the roof surface. So I know I need a longer nail. For full width shingles, a minimum of four nails should be used per shingle. Six nails can be installed uh, even required by building codes, especially in uh, high wind areas. Here's an illustration from our gallery. That's a laminated strip. Um, they're all strip, right? Three tab um, is strip shingle, but this is a laminated strip shingle, which means there's extra um, layers laminated um, in there. And uh, it's double thick where the nail goes through. So you don't want to um, nail high or nail too low you want to nail right where the two layers are the thickest, where the shingle is the thickest, to hold both top and bottom, all the layers together securely to the roof. And that would be in this location, in this illustration, um, it's below the self-adhering strip. There's the strip there, the glue, the sticky stuff, and the fastener is below it. And it's there because that's where it's thickest. That's where you get the laminate. All right. Um, there's three tab shingles, um, same thing, fasteners here in this area, according to the manufacturer's recommendations, right? They're going to be a little bit away, maybe an inch away from the edge, um, and they'll be in a zone, a nailing zone. Um, and if you've ever watched a roofer go install shingles, a veteran will just blow through, 
it, they'll throw down four to six nails in less than a second for sure. It's amazing, amazing sound. Um, so here's a laminated strip shingle, and the idea, um, the approximate fastener location is hitting that thickest part to hit that, um, and there's the self-adhealing strip. Uh, and there's four nails or six nails, typically. Um, fasteners should not appear in the five-inch area of exposure of the shingle. So if you go up on a roof and you see nail heads, exposed nail heads, in the shingle, right, just exposed, um, that's not a good thing. That's a water entry point. Typical exposure for a standard strip shingle is five inches. For metric, it's five and five-eighths. I often find um, roofing nails that have been misplaced or installed in wrong location, and they're exposed with a nail head in the field of the exposure area of the shingle, and I report it as a potential water entry point and recommend a correction and further evaluation by a roofing professional. Nails should be never, should never, nails should never be visibly exposed or weathered. Home inspectors are not required to determine conformance with the manufacturer's installation recommendations, obviously, or compliance with the local codes or regulations. But there are many standards and practices that could be checked during a typical home inspection. For example, most, if not all, asphalt composition shingle manufacturers will void the warranty if the shingles are installed on a roof with a slope less than 212. Asphalt shingles should not be installed on a roof 212 or less unless some waterproofing design details are applied, according to the manufacturer. And here's our three categories, general categories. Flat roof is zero to 212. Low is 212 to 412. And conventional is 412 and up. And steep, I guess, is, uh, well, I don't know, whatever, whenever you start to slide. All right, so um, home inspectors should know slope, because it's important. Um, yep. Uh, I'm just going to check my connection here. It's giving me some signals. Okay. Um, underlayment installations are related to slope, weather conditions, and roof type, obviously. Um, and life, expectancy, life expectancies are valuable information for a home inspector when inspecting the roof. But a fact that a system is near, at, or beyond the end of a normal service life um, doesn't by itself make the roof a material defect. And we have some in our home maintenance book, um, now that you've had a home inspection, you give these books out to your clients. Um, there's some life expectancy charts in the back, and um, it talks about the service life of a roof, a uh, typical shingle is 15 to 30. I mean, that's a big range, but at least it gives your clients, sets the expectation of your client um, about the, the life of a roof. We're on step number three. So determine if the roof is solidly sheathed, which is impossible. Um, it's really difficult, but there are a couple things that home inspectors should know. One of them is that the asphalt uh, shingles should be applied to a solid surface, obviously. And if the surface is not solid, then um, the shingles will not provide a proper, um, correct application from the weather, a protection from the weather. So the roof covering is only as strong as the substrate to which it is attached. The roof covering is only as strong and effective as the substrate to which it's attached. So during an inspection of the roof, before the underlayment and roofing go on, you can check for proper insulation of the roof sheathing. And the timing is a bit critical because a lot of roofers will quickly install underlayment to protect the building. Asphalt shingles are typically applied onto two types of decking materials. There's wood panels, like plywood and OSB, or wood planks or boards, actual boards. So you may come across other types of roof deck material like um, metal or concrete or fiber wood or non-wood materials. But in each, each situation, no matter what, the roof needs to, needs to have a nailable, uh, fastenable substrate that provides adequate support. There's um, proper thickness, design loads, including wind up, uplift, and span of supporting framing members that are important, but we're not going to go into that in this class. Nearly all sheathing problems 
are due to improper installation. And here's five quick inspection tips for checking the roof deck sheathing. First tip, sheathing should be fastened with a minimum of eight penny common nail or de deformed shank nails spaced at most six inches on center at supported panel edges and ends. And in the intermediate areas in the field of the sheathing panel, the fasteners should be at least 12 inches on center. There should be a 1 8 inch space at the panel ends and edges, and you can do that with a little nail. And the long dimension should be perpendicular to the supports, the roof framing supports. Each piece should be continuous over at least two of those spans. And the panel should be at least 24 inches wide, nothing less than that. There's panel spacers or H-clips um, installed and recommended by a lot of manufacturers. And the end joints of each adjacent piece of decking should be staggered. You shouldn't see plywood panels going up like that. Kind of staggered or offset, just like shingles. And there is a picture of an H-clip between plywood and OSB. Wood panels should be laid with the face grain perpendicular to the rafter boards. The panels should be installed over two or more spans with a long dimension or strength access oriented across the rafter boards or truss cords. In this image here, the contractor is laying down the plywood panel with the face grain perpendicular to the trusses. Staggering the panels by at least two supports is recommended. And during the installation of OSB, there's a rough surface that should be um, faced up. The rough side is a screened or skid resistant coated side. The four most common sheathing mistakes, attachment mistakes, include the wrong size fastener, missing the framing members. Um, instead of hitting the, the roof truss cord, they miss it, right? Um, overdriving the nail, same thing as uh, installing an asphalt shingle. Um, you can't overdrive the nail into the fastener into the material. And um, you could um, have too many fasteners or not enough. All right, that's three steps. Let's go to step four. Check the slope and underlayment. They're related to each other. Inspecting the underlayment is all but impossible at an existing roof. However, um, there are a few essential concepts about underlayment that should be understood by all home inspectors. So you can check out the past performance of the roof covering that you're inspecting. An underlayment does three things, essentially provides protection from the weather for a limited time until the roof covering is installed. It provides a secondary weather proofing barrier under the shingles, and it separates uh, the two materials, the substrate and the roof covering. And underlayment must be installed under asphalt shingles. Underlayment is also necessary to comply with local building codes, maintain a fire rating for the assembly, and meet requirements from the manufacturer for their warranty. And you can classify underlayment in three ways, as a single layer, as a single layer of self-adhering underlayment, the sticky stuff, ice and water shield, and as a double layer of underlayment. The water and ice dam protection membrane, often called ice and water shield, is a particular type of underlayment. It provides additional protection along the eaves at penetrations, elevation changes, along the rakes, in valleys where a lot of water or ice dams form. Uh, this type of underlayment is usually just a single layer of polymer modified bitumen underlayment that's sticky or self-adhering. And for areas that have an average temperature of 30 degrees or less Fahrenheit, 30 degrees Fahrenheit or less in January, um, a water and ice dam protection membrane is a recommended best practice and that's from the National Roofer Contractors Association. Underlayment is installed in relation to roof slopes. So if you have a roof slope of 412 or greater, like we saw in the previous illustrations, there should be a minimum single layer of underlayment applied horizontally in a shingle fashion with overlapping. For roof slopes between 212, these are low slopes, 212 and 412, a single layer of self-adhering polymer modified bitumen underlayment or a minimum double layer underlayment should be installed. Low slope roof covering systems are designed as waterproof systems, and they use roof coverings designed for slopes as low as one quarter per 12, one quarter in 12. 
Low slope roofs are commonly known as flat roofs, but they're not actually flat. If you ever find an actual flat roof, you have a pool, not a roof. There should be some slope to the roof. Step five, check the ice barrier. Now, obviously this is uh, climate um, area specific, but there's a phrase when used in describing the um, ice and water shield self-adhering underlayment. And the phrase is, a point at least 24 inches inside the exterior wall line of the building. And what this means can be seen in this illustration. So you have in a cold climate area, um, for you folks in Florida, water actually freezes and lays on top of our roofs up here in Colorado and in cold climate areas. So here's some snow. Um, warmth from the interior air um, travels up and melts the snow. The snow melts and water puddles up here, but ice is formed here because on this side, this is all um, cold, it's very cold. So you have this dynamic reaction of snow melting, causing water puddles where the ice is forming, where it's really cold on the outside and dams form and that water travels up. Just like we all know, water travels in all directions. And so the, the phrase of having 24 inches of protection from the outside of the building wall um, is this. So you measure 24 inches here and go up. And you should have a, an ice and water shield at this area all the way to this edge. So in areas where there has been a history of ice forming along the eaves, causing a backup of water, an ice barrier that's made up of at least two layers of underlayment cemented together or a self-adhering polymer modified bitumen sheet, the sticky ice and water shield, that should be used. Um, from the lowest edge of all roof surfaces to a point at least 24 inches inside the exterior wall line of the building. And there's a, another illustration. You can get these from our gallery. Ice dams can form along an eave, therefore the underlayment must be modified to prevent ice dams from forming, forcing water under the roof covering. So beyond the 24 inch point, um, there's special underlayment considerations because um, it's really unnecessary, all this special stuff. You get to a certain point um, above the heated space and uh, um, we're not really worried about those ice dams up there. For slopes less than 412 and in locations with heavy snowfall, a best practice would extend um, to 36 inches and that's by the NRCA. All right, that was um, five steps. We're halfway there, let's go to step number six, which is check the drip edge. And the drip edge metal should be installed at the rake and eaves. It provides a means of terminating the underlayment and asphalt shingles nicely. And it provides an efficient method to shed water. I always take a picture of the drip edge area. If I'm going up to the eaves with my ladder, I'm gonna make it, so there's no drip edge here. You can see the, the gutter edge there and there's some capping and there's the plywood. So there's no drip edge installed there. I always take a picture. Most codes require a drip edge um, material, metal material, to be installed. It's most, um, it's very common for asphalt shingle installations. And here's some shapes. Um, the two on the left are kind of like capping, it's not really gonna shed or let water drip off. Um, and this one is an L drip edge, L shape, and this one's a common T shape, common. What's important to know about drip edge is the following five things. The installation and material of a drip edge usually it depends on the local practices and the shingle manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, the drip edge at the rake goes over the underlayment. The drip edge material at the rake, which is along the gable, right, goes over the underlayment, to, helps it secure it. The drip edge at the eaves goes under the underlayment so that the underlayment can shed that water right off into the gutter. The drip edge should be fastened every 12 inches or six inches if there's wind. And a recommended best practice at the eaves is to have the bottom edge of the underlayment extend over the edge of the drip edge a little bit, like a quarter of an inch. And that's from the Asphalt Roofing Manufacturers Association, their recommendation. Here's what it looks like. So some roofers will install this immediately to get a good edge. And that's what it looks like. So this is the plywood, right? This is the rafter tail, rafter board, right? And there's the 
shape. There's the T shape, has a little curve out. When the gutter guys come in, uh, they'll put the capping around underneath and install the gutters. Here's ice and water shield to the very edge of it. Here's, um, oh, this is uh, the drip edge along the rake. You know that because of the fasteners. Remember uh, the green fastener from before the underlayment? Um, there's a nail fastener for the underlayment with a little overlap. And at the rake, the drip edge goes over the underlayment. What is causing this pattern on this roof, these shingles? So it's called offsetting. So step number seven is check for an offset pattern. It's kind of common for um, shingles to be installed in an offset pattern. Um, there are a few offset patterns in the shingle installation to look for. One common to the application of square end three tab strip shingles is a six inch offset pattern, which will cause the cutouts, um, you know, the tabs, they'll be aligned on every other row. A more random visual effect, effect can be made using an offset pattern of a five inch method, which is uh, achieved with um, laminate strip shingles. And you just remove a chunk of the shingles. This is like a racking going on here, um, going vertically straight up, almost vertically straight up. But there's no offset, really. A racking or vertical insulation of shingles is generally not recommended for asphalt shingles. There are some exceptions for some manufacturers, and each manufacturer has their own guideline about offsetting. Step eight, check the roof valley flashing. A valley is created at the intersection of two downsloping roof planes. And the valley is vulnerable to water intrusion because of the high volume of water and the lower slope of the valley line. That's a little inspection tip. If you're going up on the roof, you're not required to go or walk upon any roof surface according to the standards, but I walk the valley because it's the lower slope. For example, where, four, where two 412 roof slopes make a valley, the valley is only about 312. So it's lower slope and it's more prone to water penetration. Uh, remember, the standards of practice do not require you to walk upon any roof surface, surface so just don't. For asphalt shingle roofs, there are three basic types of valleys. There's an open, there's a closed cut, and there's a woven. Open, closed cut, you know, cut it, and then there's a woven one. So open valleys, here's what you need to know about open valleys. An open valley is when the shingles are lapped onto both sides of the valley flashing metal, leaving an open space, and the flashing is typically metal. A 36 inch minimum, uh, a layer of polymer modified bitumen membrane with self adhering underlayment should be in the valley under the metal flashing, uh, 36 inches wide. And the metal flashing should be a minimum of 24 inches wide, according to NRCA. And the asphalt shingles should not lap onto the flange of the metal. Um, oh, it should. They sh the shingles should lap at least four inches onto the, onto the metal. And there's me inspecting uh, the top of uh, an open valley. And right here, um, you know, at the very top ridge of the valley, I tend to find um, damage because someone steps on it. Here's what you need to know about closed cut valley. Um, there are shingles on one side of the valley installed across the valley. And then you get the other plane of shingles. And the shingles from the other side are cut above, about two inches short of the center line of the valley. No nails should be located within the six, inch, uh, six inches of the center line of the valley. The upper corner of each shingle end should be trimmed or dog-eared, they call them. This helps to, to divert the water away. And a bead of uh, sealant cement could be added. And here's the, um, here's the first layer on this illustration. This layer was laid down first. It goes across the valley. Uh, this layer comes over here, but it's cut short, about two inches, and it's cut, right? And each shingle has a dog ear. There's a closed cut of um, two different kinds of <laughs> shingles on this roof, in this valley. One was gray, one was brown, essentially. 
A woven valley is when the shingles are simply woven into a closed valley. Um, they're usually created with uh, three tab shingles, not laminated ones. Step nine of the 10 step checklist. Uh, step nine is check the nail penetration into the deck sheathing. If the sh thickness of the deck sheathing, um, if the, yeah, I was just checking, step eight was check the roof valley flashing. Um, check the nail penetration into the roof deck sheathing. It's kind of difficult. Uh, if you're in Florida, wind mitigation, you're doing it all the time, actually. If the thickness of the deck sheathing is more than three quarters of an inch, the nails must be long enough to penetrate three quarters of an inch into it. If the thickness of the sheathing is less than three quarters of an inch, the nails for the asphalt shingles must be long enough to penetrate through it, ideally a, a one eighth of an inch through it on the other side. You can see it from the attic. Uh, here's an illustration of um, two layers of asphalt shingles and the fastener is just not long enough. So you can see that the roofing nail doesn't penetrate enough into the deck material, and that's bad. The double layer of shingles in this illustration caused by a second layer of shingles being installed over a lower layer requires the use of a, a nail of a longer length. Here's an inspection tip. At a roof over where you have two layers of asphalt, asphalt shingles, I lightly tug on the shingles to see how well they're attached. Sometimes they just simply pull out. You can pull them right out because they're nailed maybe a quarter of an inch into the substrate, or maybe not at all, and they just simply pull out. It's really a, a problem. Step 10, last step on the 10 steps to performing a roof inspection, check the flashing areas. It's kind of like the Second thing I do when I go up on a roof to do a, an inspection, I take a look in the general fields of the, the planes of the roof, and then I go to the um, flashing areas. And there are four types of flashing. Penetration flashings, vertical surface flashings, like wall flashing, um, skylight flashing, skylights have just about every type of flashing on it, uh, and steep to low slope transition flashing, some, sometimes called head wall flashing. For penetration flashings, that's one of the types, you should check the following items. The vent pipes, the exhausts, the exhaust vents and exhaust fans, uh, the furnace or water heater flue pipes, electrical stand pipes, and anything else that penetrates the roof covering materials. The penetration flashing is usually supplied by the manufacturer or it could be made um, uh, on, on the roof by the contractor. And it should never look like this. Um, there's the there's a heating system metal flue pipe and there's a there's a fan there. I just don't like these. Uh, they didn't need to nail that down if they installed the shingles. Uh, if they installed the fan in the right position. Um, there are four types of vertical surface flashings in your report. You should use these following terms to describe the flashing components that you're inspecting, and they are apron flashing. Think of an apron you, when you're barbecuing, cooking. Apron flashing, it's in the front. It's down below, low. Step flashing is on the sides, steps up. Cricket or backer flashing. Cricket, it looks like a saddle, right? It looks like a little gable roof or something in the back, backer flashing. And counter flashing, and that um, goes over something else, goes over another piece of flashing, counter. So apron flashing is installed where the roof intersects a head wall. Common locations for apron flashing is at the front side or down side of a dormer, a chimney, or anywhere there's a transition between a horizontal and a vertical. And here's the um, illustration. We have um, the substrate wall, let's say, and there's a substrate of the roof. And um, this is the house wrap coming down over the counter flashing. So this is the counter flashing, and it covers this flashing, counter flashing covers other flashing, and this flashing here is the apron flashing, right? So you can see all the layering and shedding. So, and this is the underlayment. Here's the shingle. And this illustration is available to all inspectors at our gallery. Step flashing is installed where the roof intersects a vertical side wall along the side of a wall. 
Step flashings are small individual pieces of metal installed with each shingle course, and they step with each shingle course. Um, and a chimney, a masonry chimney is a really great illustration. A cricket or backer flashing is installed when the roof intersects a chimney or a curbed roof penetration. The cricket diverts water around the penetration, the chimney, let's say. It diverts it around. It looks like a gable roof. It could be a saddle flashing or cricket flashing right behind a wide chimney. Diverts water around. While the backer flashing provides a weatherproofing transition material right where the backside of something penetrates the in intersection of the roof. And a skylight is a really good example. A skylight, all skylights have backer flashings. They don't have crickets or saddles. A skylight would have a backer flashing, where it's a waterproof flashing on the top side, back side uh, of, the, um, of the object that penetrates the roof. Uh, another example of a backer flashing would be a chimney that's not very wide. Let's say it's only 20 inches wide. You put backer flashing. You wouldn't, uh, the code or barreling practice doesn't require a cricket or a saddle flashing to be installed on a very narrow chimney stack. A recommended best practice is to install a cricket when the chimney stack is more than 30 inches wide. NRCA recommends 24 inches wide. And here's an example of a, a saddle or a cricket flashing. That's what that is behind the chimney. Counter flashing is flashing material that covers and protects the top edges of other flashing to prevent water intrusion. So this is a chimney stack or a sidewall here. Uh, counter flashing, it's been grooved into the masonry and sealed up. And then there's a strip down here as well that's been sealed over. Um, this is a really great, this is probably the best counter flashing installation I've seen. And skylight flashings are very much like chimney flashings with apron step and backer flashings, not cricket or saddle. In most installations, the skylight unit itself acts as a counter flashing. So skylights are really fun to inspect. Steep to low slope transition flashings are installed where the sloped shingle roof intersects and drains onto a low sloped or membrane flat roof. So you have a, a nice slope roof with asphalt shingles and then it transitions into something else. In many cases, the lowest course of shingles acts as the counter flashing. Ideally, there would be metal flashing installed. Don't step at this transition. It can be very sensitive. Uh, you can put your foot right through something. Um, sometimes the, the roof covering material is actually um, off of the substrate. So if you put your weight down on it, you'll tear the material. And congratulations, that was 10 steps to performing a roof inspection. In this online class, we learned 10 steps to performing a roof inspection, and here they are again. Step one, check the roof covering, and then you check the fasteners that holds the roof covering to the substrate, right? And then you check the deck sheathing, which is underneath. And a, the strength of a roof covering is only as strong as the substrate to which it's attached, right? Check the slope and underlayment. They're related to each other. Check the ice barrier, especially if in cold climates. Check the drip edge. Should be installed at the reeves and the eight, uh, in the rake. Um, check for an offset pattern. Check the manufacturer's recommendations for offsetting and racking. Check the roof valley flashing. Um, it's lower slope where two slopes come together, prone to more penetration because of its lower slope. Check the nail penetration into the deck sheathing. It's important to get those nails in there. And check the flashing areas, which is the funnest part. Um, if you want a little bit more information on roof inspections, well, we have a ton, actually. Um, and it's at this very long URL. Sorry it's so long. It's at NACHI. Or it's called Mastering Roof Inspections, a whole series of articles written by InterNACHI's Kenton Shepard. Um, NACHI.org slash mastering hyphen roof hyphen inspections natchi.org slash mastering hyphen roof hyphen inspections um, let's do a quick roof inspection if you want we'll do uh, this is uh, an actual roof inspection that I did uh, during a typical home inspection um, I use tall ladders so I go up on the roof I'm um, not required to um, and I take pictures a lot of pictures of all of the roof planes and the shingle materials look really good 
and I put all these pictures in my inspection report, and then I check the vents. So that's the ridge vent, and it's nailed uh, well, except um, I recommended that these nails that are popping out be reinstalled um, and covered up again. I really don't like the choice of this roof vent very much. Um, there's a chimney, masonry chimney. Chimneys are fun to inspect, especially the flashing, because it has those four components. Four, apron, that's one. Step on the sides, that's two. Um, backer, right, or for waterproof, for a narrow, to, or a cricket or saddle flashing. And then the counter flashing. So it's kind of fun. Um, and the, the flashing was okay. I mean, a little bent here and there, but it actually was doing really well. Flashing around the vent pipes, flashing at the head wall. So there's flashing around the vent pipe here, flashing at the head wall here. The shingles look great. I don't see anything damaged, cracked. The shingles were adhered to each other. Um, there's the backer flashing. This is a waterproof flashing at the top of the skylight. Really great. And then they were installing some other pieces of flashing here I was concerned with, but it looked okay. Step flashing on the sides. Counter flashing is the skylight itself. Step flashing looks good. Those are cracked in the skylight. And there were um, actually two layers of asphalt shingles. You can see the two layers here. So I was concerned about the fastening of the second layer. And there's my trick. So I go to the edge, rake edge, and I pull them up and check out how they were installed. And there's two layers. Two fingers means two layers. And the gutters are okay. There's no drip edge. So the drip edge here was missing, and we started to get some deterioration of the original um, uh, structure. The substrate was deteriorating. And that looked good that looked good gutters okay i really don't like the way this downspout diverts water right into the seam of the three tab ideally there's a better practice but that was about the roof inspection cool so i hope you had fun i'm going to check the i apologize for all the technical problems i hope you hung in there with me i'm going to check the um, recording of the video of this class and i'll put it up on our youtube channel um, this was 10 Steps to Performing a Roof Inspection Class. I'm Ben Gamerico from InterNACHI. If you have any questions, email me, ben at InterNACHI.org. If you'd like to register for the upcoming class or watch our recent classes because we record them all, it's at nachi.org forward slash, na oh, sorry, nachi.org forward slash class. Um, and then if you're a student from New York, uh, we have a page for you. It's at nachi.org slash New York. All right, everybody. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Thanks for coming to class.